Martin was when I the guy I had no name for him. His original name there he is. <laughs> he's huge. He's huge. He's, he's gigantic. But the thing about <laughs> it is, it was a friend of mine. It was her daughter. Okay. Okay. And it was her daughter's cat, and she didn't take care of him. Aww. And so my friend called and said, "If you don't take him, I'm taking him to the pound." So I brought him home, and he's so sweet, and he's so lovable, but she named him, his name was Thor. <laughs> and I said, that, that, he doesn't look like a Thor, you know? <laughs> so uh, what happened, I'm telling the guys at work about it, and so one of the guys start calling him Mr. Fluffers. <laughs> everybody start calling him Mr. Fluffers. So that's his name. But I never... I never like to say it in front of him because he gets embarrassed. <laughs> he still thinks he feels he feels he's a. He Thor. thinks he's Thor. <laughs> I think you need to get like a little a little hat, you know, like a little oh. Viking hat he, for him, maybe. He would wear it, <laughs> but he's so big. He's so he won't stop. I mean, it's, it's a Christ. He's like eighteen pounds. <laughs> You know, no. oh God! How, is he a anyway. cat or a young cat? Is he old? How old is he? Well, I'm. I think he's around seven. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, I think he's around seven. Okay. But you know, I never, never really asked. And it's a big secret <laughs> that I can't, you know, put any pictures of him anywhere because it, her daughter might see it <laughs> and say, "Wait a minute, what's Wait that's minute. Thor?" His name is Thor. It's not Mr. Fluffers. Oh my God, that's, that's, uh, that's yeah, that's it's Mr. Fluffers. Off. Mr. <laughs> so oh, what, I, what I want to do, and first of all, thank you for getting up and getting Mr. Oh, no, I've been up for hours. You really get up at 4 a.m.? Yeah. Like on purpose or not on purpose? Yeah, I just wake up at 4 o'clock. Uh, and Yeah. And it's, uh, and what happens is at night I try to stay awake, but by 8 o'clock I can't yeah. do it. No. And I'm back in bed. So it's a, a terrible cycle. <laughs> of, you know. I'm just going to bed early. Well, it's dark, yeah. super dark here at four. I mean, we're we're an hour oh. dark. You know, so I'm sure it's still dark in Atlanta, though, at four. It's got to be. No, no, it stays late to uh, light to about seven. But the thing is, I remember in New York, it would always get dark at four o'clock. Yeah. But there were so many lights in the city. I think you that made it know. seem darker. You know? Well, that was an adjustment I made when I moved to Maine is we, we're an hour earlier getting dark. So at, in December, it gets dark at 3.30 in the afternoon, like, you know, at Christmas. <laughs> oh, my God. That would, uh... <laughs> Mr. Fluffers has his own show now. We're good. I know. I mean, <laughs> you don't mind this, like, in the middle oh, of Oh, God, no. Are you kidding? I have three kids, and no, please. No. There's nothing, nothing that will embarrass or bother me. So <laughs> there's like a cat on the other end of this. <laughs> there is a cat. We had a dog. We don't have a dog. We sadly had to put the dog down this summer. He, oh, he was 16. That. He made it to the last high school graduation. He was a great wow. dog. Wow. I'm oh, actually happy tough. not having one for a while, I think. Well, that's the other thing. I mean, my uh, I had a dog too, and uh, you know, every day I have to take him out and walk him and yeah, all this yeah. other stuff. You have to, and, have to feed I live him. in a yeah. You know, <laughs> this one, he doesn't stop eating. Oh, well, he, he's and he like, meows and meows when he's hungry. He follows me around. You know, so. He needs to have his own TikTok account. Do you do TikTok? Have you gotten? No, TikTok? I didn't even know what the heck that was. Um, yeah, it's, it's painful. It's, um, yeah. I, I put it on my phone. My kids are like, Oh mom, you got to do TikTok," And I'm like, but I don't even, I don't want to do a dance. I don't, you know, so yeah. I put it on my phone and then I, I ended up taking it off. I, it's not my demographic. It's just not, it's not. Yeah. Right. I mean, so, it, and I think yeah. it's a lot of really silly stuff too. It is. It's most, yeah. and I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you and me both. I mean, I'm, people come to me with serious questions all the time. <laughs> uh, so here's what I want to do this morning, and, and thank you again uh, for doing this. I'm just oh delighted. yeah, my this pleasure. Is wonderful, sure. and um, so I just want to do sort of like you know an interview of where you came from. I I know a lot of it because I've seen some right. of the interviews, and I was and I lived Channel 17, you know, growing up. So, but right. I would love to sort of get the story. There's a few there's a few missing pieces that I was curious about. So just if you if that's okay, we'll just do some open ended yeah. questions and kind yeah. of roll through it. Whatever you want to do. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So I, I know you're not originally from Atlanta. You grew up in Pennsylvania, right? Right. In Pittsburgh. 
in Pittsburgh. How, how, what was your upbringing like? Did you, were you a performing arts kid or a sports kid? No, no, no. I, I literally grew up across the street from a steel mill. Oh, okay. And uh, I mean, every day, every morning at eight o'clock, I'm not kidding you, the whistle would blow and you'd see all these guys walk into the mill and at four o'clock in the afternoon, the whistle would blow again. And you'd see all these guys walking out of the mill and they're all dirty and, you know, carrying their lunch buckets and everything. Else. And I remember even as a kid saying, I never want to do that. Yeah. I just yeah. never want to do that. But I went to a vocational high school. Okay. Uh, I had, and I, I'll be honest with you. My parents, and I think everybody's parents always said, oh, I wish I would have done better in school. And I wish I could go back to school. I hated school. <laughs> I still hate the thought of school. And, and that's terrible to say. So I just barely made it through. So I ended up in a vocational high school. Okay. And I wanted to take the print shop because I like printing. I love setting type and running printing presses because I, I work part time at a print shop. That's another story. Okay. So sure enough, I signed up for it. And the summer between eighth grade and going into high school, they removed the print shop. Oh, so I got thrown in wood shop. <laughs> so I had four years of wood shop. I can't build a thing. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, honest to God, I can't I forget about it. <laughs> so, so, but you eventually, so how did you get from wood shop? Because I know you became, got into radio. So, how, how well, yeah, and that, that was the other thing. That was the other thing. Uh, I always had this fascination with, with broadcasting and radio. And I mean, I, I remember my godfather's daughter had a copy of the, uh, look at this cat. <laughs> He's the best cat. My God. <laughs> He's heard this story His before. Feet are like, He's yeah. He's kicking me. Ow, <laughs> not again. Me. Not, not yeah. the Prince job story again. Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I've heard this a million times. <laughs> anyway, uh, now I forgot where I was. We're talking about uh, your fascination oh, yeah, with radio. Broadcast. So anyway, I always had a fascination with radio. And I mean, I would say my godfather's daughter had a copy of the record, the vinyl record of the War of the Worlds, the radio broadcast. And I remember... She loaned it to me, and, you know, back in those days, you couldn't record anything. Right. So I wrote down the entire script. I mean, word for word, you know, and every character. And, like, by the age of 10, I had memorized the entire War of the World script. But I always had this thing with radio and everything. And uh, so I, I, I used to play disc jockey. And, you know, now with Facebook, I find out there were five. I used to think I was the only guy in the world that did this. But then I found out now because Facebook, there's about 48,000 guys that did the same thing. You know, they all <laughs> sat in their house playing their records, pretending to be disc jockeys. <laughs> but that's what I did. And then uh, when I was 16, I landed a job at a little radio station. Um, and, what, did you, what, did your, what did your dad do? Your, what did your parents do for a while? He drew, my father basically was a truck driver. He delivered caskets. And then for a while he was... He was kind of, he moved up the ladder. He became a casket salesperson. And then he eventually ended, in, ended up in one. So, I mean, I guess he did I was, the whole thing. I was waiting for the punchline. <laughs> I'm waiting. I was like, it's, it, it, it's formulating in my brain with the punchline. Uh, oh, my yeah, God. That's so you're not true. supposed so is that where no. your dad is now? No, you know? Is your dad still driving the casket truck? No, because I, <laughs> as, a, as a Southerner, we're, we're so fascinated with death and funerals that I find funerals hilarious. And I oh, that, yeah. Well, you know. you know, they did this on the old Tush show. Uh, we had a sketch about two funeral directors. Yes. And they literally used a line my dad used to write on the bills. He never wrote the word funeral. He would write Smith Fun Home. <laughs> And that's, and when they were doing the Tush show, they were doing this sketch and one day they're going, and I'm watching them do it. And at the end of it says, and remember the first three letters of funeral are F-U-N. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. My dad was doing that in 1956. Or that's it. You hacks. We, we've already done it. Yeah. Already done that an job. old, oh old my God. joke. Yeah. That's, that's, a, did you have siblings growing up or did you? Was it no, just, I was uh, only child. Probably if I would have had brothers or sisters, I wouldn't have had the free reign that I did. I mean, you know, like nobody ever said, stop 
pretending to be a disc jockey or right. stop the, you know, the, I went through a period where I was charging the neighborhood to come in and watch uh, movies in my backyard. I, I, I did a, an outdoor theater in the summertime on weekends and sold candy and popcorn. And, and now I'm back in the theater business I was again. I going to say, it's which, completely yeah. full circle. That's it's, awesome. It's, yeah, yeah. I think That's... in two years, I'm going to get a paper route. <laughs> And then I'm going to end the whole thing. <laughs> I'm going to throw papers and, and deliver milk. Yeah, oh, yeah I'll, be, I'll be right back where it oh started. Oh, my God. I, lo I love that it's full circle. So, all right. So yeah. I want to go to the, the first, the, the first uh, radio station. Is this the Polka Party radio station? Yeah. WTRA. Okay. And I did the Polka Party every... Uh, it's funny. I was talking to a guy the other day, and they were talking about crazy songs. And I says, how about, let me get it right. Uh, your lips tell me no, no, but there's yes, yes in your eyes. <laughs> that's an old polka. And I remember it that. Is it, it's an old, yeah, that's a real polka. You know? Of course, um, now you'd get thrown to jail for that and everything else. You, you know? would not be able to. There was, a pol there was a polka, have you ever heard of the world's most dangerous polka band? Yeah. R Ruth Adams and the Most Dangerous Polka Band. Yeah, yeah. When I, I was touring doing comedy and we were in Minneapolis and there's this little lounge, it was called the Nye's Polonaise Polka Lounge. And my friend said, we have to go, we have to, and you know, I'm from the South. We didn't grow up with polka, like maybe they did in right. Pennsylvania, but so anyway, like we went, but it was, they were all in their nineties, this polka. Oh band. yeah. And I'm, I'm sure they're not, they're, they're probably with your dad, but they, they, uh, <laughs> they, it was fascinating. These, these people in the Midwest with their polka love. So, but you had a whole oh, polka sure. show, like a, like every day polka like every day well here, here was the thing the, the the radio station was country music oh okay so i did the morning show see here's the thing you know the morning guy is supposed to be the most talented the funniest the wittiest you know the, the high price guy but when you go to a 500 watt radio station and you get a job they make you the morning man because nobody else wants to do it Nobody wants to get up at five in the morning and go in there. So here I was 16 years old. I was the morning man on the radio. I didn't even know how to press the right buttons, but I was the morning. Man. But then, so I would do the morning show from like 6 a.m. till 9. And get off at 9 and then at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, go back on and do the polka party oh from God. 10 till noon. <laughs> And then at noon, they would do a show that was, they would announce the births. <laughs> you, you, you announce the births. And then after the births, you did the deaths. Yes, I was going to say, are the deaths coming next? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you literally it was called In Memoriam. Oh, my God. So they used to call that block the coming and going show. <laughs> but, see, there are a lot of great radio stories people don't know about. And you know what? Here's the thing. That that is so awesome, and they should have that now. No, no one has that now. Everything. To no. Me, you know they need to bring back the coming and going show. They do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I used to. You know, I used to have to, uh, in the morning, stop by the hospital and get the, the the birth announcements for the day. You know, I didn't have to go to the funeral homes. They called in. <laughs> well, I think we got five bucks a head for the, the funeral home. Well, I, I tell this story about my, my parents grew up in Monticello, Georgia, and the, the newspaper only comes out once every other week. So, oh, geez, yeah. So, if you, if you, so you have to go by the funeral home every day, and they have a sign, and if someone has passed, they put a little star on the top of the sign. And if the star is out, you go inside and you say, who's dead? And then they, <laughs> they tell you. Who's if you, dead? Who's dead? Who, who has died? That and one then, over there. That guy. And then do you know him? And then, <laughs> because if you wait for the paper, you'll miss the obituary and you'll miss the food. And so. Well, that's the important thing, the food. The food. So anyway, so the star, my grandmother lived down the street and we called, as as children, we made fun, we called it the death star and she didn't know what we were talking about. The but, de oh, <laughs> so, that's but a, anyway. isn't that a Star Wars uh, reference? So that's, that's what we grew up with, <laughs> the funeral home down the road. Um, so anyway, we, I digress into funerals again. Um, so you, you did the polka party at this radio station, and then you went to West Virginia from there, or was there something? No, else? I got fired. I went back to high school, <laughs> back to Woodshop. 
Why did you get fired? I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> How I talked, you? I had never been in a radio station. Oh, I love this. Yeah. And I mean, I didn't know, I literally did not, didn't know what I was doing, but I would go in there every morning and I have to sign the station on, you know, turn all the buttons on. And, and I couldn't even figure this thing out. Imagine trying to turn a radio station on. <laughs> well, they hired you. They should have had some clue, but maybe not. They didn't know. I was 16. I got $50 a week. I, I don't <laughs> think I ever did get paid. <laughs> After, after the coming and going. Oh my God. Okay. So then you, so you went back to high school and you finished wood shop. Wood right? shop. Yeah. Okay. And, and then, yeah. then what did you do after high school? Did you move or stay or? No, I went right back. I went right back to work in radio. Okay. And uh, what happened, I landed a job as a traffic report. God, this is, this is going to take forever if I tell this whole story about everywhere I work. But I, I landed a job as a traffic reporter for the automobile club, the AAA. Okay. And I would have to go in every morning at 7 a.m. and call all the radio stations in Pittsburgh. There was like 10 stations I called. So I was on every major radio station in Pittsburgh at, in, in drive time in the morning. So I got to be pretty well known, you know, just doing traffic reports. Yeah. And then I don't know what it was, but one of the stations decided I was worth putting on live because they would just record me, you know. Right, right. And they and so they said, would you do it live? And I'm like, sure. So then I became part of their show. Okay. And then another station found out about it. So I was doing like four or five stations live. And I was like having my own little show there. And uh, I mean, it was a pretty good little gig, you know, but I, I wanted to be in the radio station. Right, right. So, and then one of the stations uh, needed a person to work in their West Virginia station. Okay. A, an announcer. And they asked if I'd like the job and I recorded, yeah. So that's how I ended up there in, in okay. West Virginia. Okay. And then one thing led to another and then it's, it's a series of things. But then uh, the one station I was working for in 74 went on strike. The announcers okay. went on strike. And boy, God forbid anybody should live without the announcers. <laughs> now, what do we do? There are no announcers. But anyway, we don't know if we go to work. Is it going to rain? I don't know. <laughs> What's happening outside? <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid to look out the window without the announcers. So, <laughs> Oh, God. Anyway, so they asked me if I wanted to. So I'm now on 74. So what happened? That we're on strike. Okay. And I was dating a girl that, that had just graduated from college. I was much younger back then. And uh, although I was still dating a girl that just got out of college. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. Put the no. fun in funeral. That's good. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, uh, what happened was. She said, Atlanta is, is a jumping town. She says, I'm thinking of moving to Atlanta. My friend and I are thinking of moving to Atlanta. Okay. So I said to my buddy, I says, hey, why don't we get in the car and go to Atlanta? So I, I mean, I was free. I had nothing to do. So we hopped in the car and drove down to Atlanta. And I saw, I was listening to this WGST radio, which you're familiar with. Yeah. And at that time they played oldies. And I was into that music. And I said, well, let's find this radio station and go. And I walked in with a tape in my hand and got oh, hired. Wow. That's great. Yeah. 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 And I was there about, I don't know, a couple of months. And then I became familiar with this television station I was watching and ran all these great old movies and realized I passed it on the way to work every day. Right, right. And it was Channel 17 in Atlanta, a local television station. Yep. And I walked in again with a tape in my hand. And one person took me to another person. And they told me, and this is not made up, they said, well, the guy we had doing all of our announcing work quit <laughs> the other day, and we need somebody. Would you do it for $50 a week? Now I'm back to making $50 a week. <laughs> Full circle. But I, now it was television. Right, right. And it turns out, I found this out later, it was owned by this local business guy named Ted Turner. And I spent the rest of my career there. 
and yeah. that's that's basically how that all happened. You, know? it just, and, you walked in on the on the literally the right day, the right time. Well, that's it. You yeah. know, it's it's one of the. If I would have walked in the day after, it would have never happened. Right. Right. Or the day before, it would have never happened. Well, I, and I, it just it, yeah. It's it to me. It's the universe because to me, it's 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 who you are and and you know and it, there was clearly a connection with the movies and you know that you 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 found the station through liking the movies and then you you got in there mm -hmm. that way. I'm I'm because we grew up with it, but we only called it Channel Seventeen. We didn't. Yeah, know, everybody but, did. It was just one of the four channels that we got. You know, we got Channel Eight. That was yeah. Sesame Street. But we we watched the Little Rascals before school, and we you know oh, yeah. watched Ultraman on the week and Georgia w w wrestling. Gordy, you know, we, we Gordon watched, Soley. Uh, Gordon, Gordon Soley, Soley. Yeah. Our, and, our favorite uh, was um, Abdullah the Butcher. He was always my Abdullah favorite. the Butcher. You know, uh, uh, Abdullah is somebody. You know, he was the madman from the Sudan. Right. He was a 400 pound African American. I mean, you know, and he was like supposed to be crazy. Yeah. He just always made faces and he never talked. And, uh, and somebody asked me one time, they said, is wrestling real? I says, all I can tell you is Abdullah the butcher drives a brand new Lincoln. So I, <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that. If it's they give the madman from the Sudan a license and he goes out and buys a new Lincoln, something's <laughs> working right there, Something whether it's good. fake or not. Do you, do you remember he used to eat the pictures of his opponents? He used to eat everything. He used to, <laughs> that was his deal. He would bite into everything. We have a great outtake, uh, a great outtake. Now, uh, you know who Freddie Miller is. Freddie yeah. Miller was the wrestling desk announcer. Yeah. You had one that did play-by-play. Freddie was the colored guy, I guess, but Freddie yeah. wore a bad toupee and he was a Oh yeah, we remember man. Freddie quite well. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was on there one day, Abdullah's standing behind him with a two by four. And there's some other wrestlers. And Freddie's going, This Saturday night, don't forget to be there at the Savannah Civic Center when Abdullah the Butcher takes on so and Abdullah's going. <laughs> and he goes and he hits Freddie by accident in the head with the two by four. But you hear this sound just like that. And Freddie fixes his toupee and keeps talking. And Abdullah starts laughing. <laughs> I mean, he's going, <laughs> he couldn't stop. <laughs> oh, it's a great, great piece oh, of video. Well, and that, yeah. to me, that was this an era before before now that is never coming back but was so wonderful it just it, you know i'm i'm, I'm well sure that's you i mean it. you know I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something karen i used to when i first started in television i would say boy i wish i were around for the golden age you know i wish i were there when they were doing live dramas and everything and then i realized now i was in a different golden age yeah yeah you know, the, the whole cable thing had started, uh, satellite television had started. We went from this local TV station to here comes the cat. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, <laughs> I said, the cat's we, you know, come on, get out of here. I'm trying He's to back. How did he do that? Did it. he go around your phone and came back? That was awesome. Yeah, he just, there he goes again. Mr. He just walks. Oh, get out of here. It's a one man show. Anyway, uh, but, you know, we had all this stuff happening and like the wrestling was a simple thing. You know, they would come in on Friday night, they would set up the ring, they would set up the chairs. Then on Saturday morning, all the cars would pull in the parking lot for all the fans that came in. They would sit out there. I swear, I, I used to see them eight o'clock on a Saturday morning passing a fifth of whiskey yeah, waiting. before they would go in to watch the wrestling show. <laughs> but, you know, why not? I mean, that's a fun show. You know? Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. And we would do the wrestling show live. There was no, none of this fireworks and all this other right. stuff that they have now. It was in that room. And yeah. as, as kids watching it, we were, we were glued. I mean, oh, yeah. We were glued. And we were, I used to see Cub Scout troops. I'm like, how did they get to yeah. go? You know, and, you know, we all... <laughs> I'm so, I don't know what to do with It's hilarious. He's totally fine. Yeah. Okay. So, so we have all that great stuff. And then at some point you started doing the news in the middle of the night because Ted didn't want to do news. 
Well, see, we didn't know that at the time, that he didn't want to do news. Again, it was one of those things. What happened was the news show, what was the news, was buried at 3 o'clock in the morning. Right. We only did news because we had to, you know, do, do so much uh, public affairs broadcasting. Yeah. And, of course, you know, we were a UHF station, and our money was in the old reruns of Beverly Hillbillies, Andy Griffith, all that. Right. When you did news, it was a big expense. I mean, you know, especially in those days, it was on film. So you needed a film processing department. You needed reporters. You needed cars. You needed everything. Yeah. You know, well, we just didn't have that. So at three o'clock in the morning, I used to read the news on an audio tape. And there would be a slide on that just said news. And for yeah. 20 minutes, yeah. you heard me read news. And then one day, Ted came into work and he said, is there anybody that can sit in front of the camera and do that? And they said, Bill, you want to do it? I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll do it. So I did. And, you know, we played it straight. I would come sit at this cardboard desk we had, no set. I mean, it was a blue wall because we used to use the wall for commercials. And uh, I would just read the news. Well, one night something silly happened. My hair was messed up or something. Then the director came on and said, fix your hair right in the middle of the news. So I fixed my hair. I had hair back. And uh, so we, you know, I did that. And then something happened a couple nights later. And then it started building and it getting goofier and crazier. And, and we figured it was at three o'clock in the morning. Nobody sees it we can get away with it. Well, back to the Channel 17 thing, I'm out walking the streets one day, just, you know, going to the store or whatever, and people yell at me, hey, Channel 17, and they wave, and <laughs> oh my God, there's people watching people it. People were watching. They were watching. Yeah. And then one day, Ted came in, and I'm sitting there in a little cubicle I had by the on-air equipment, projectors and stuff, and he said, uh, Hey, Bill, I saw what you did last night. That was really funny. And he kept walking. And I thought, oh, wait a minute. If he thinks it's funny and he owns the station, yeah. I guess we're okay. Yeah. That was like, that was like, oh, now you it's have okay. Permission, complete permission. So then we went nuts. Then we went nuts. Oh, it, and then, uh, yeah. It, yeah. It was amazing. I will tell you, my dad, my, all my comedy stuff really comes from watching TV with my dad. But sure. my, I remember my dad saying, you're getting up at 3 a.m. You've got to see this. Like my dad got me up to to see you. Wow, that's funny. Um, th th this is the same dad dad that made me get up at 1 a.m. to go to L.O. Bean because they were open 24 hours a day. <laughs> so you've got to <laughs> you got to see this. They're open all night. So, but we so my dad and I were, would watch you at, at 3 a.m. And there was no taping back. You know, there were no VCRs. You had to you had yeah. to get up. But anyway, so I got to ask you about like I know about Rex the Wonder Dog who was wonderful, but to me. That was a one-time deal. He was just the one time. But what about and that? Was you know what always <laughs> amazes me about that? There's okay. A couple of years ago, I uh, did the MC of a, a a reunion of TBS people, and Ted was there, and I brought up the fact that it seems everybody you know when CNN. I'm going to see if I put this in order. When CNN first started. There weren't 15,000 employees, right. you know, at four o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning, there might have been 10 employees of the entire CNN company there. Well, for some reason, one morning, Ted in his bathrobe from his office walked down to where there was a break room at CNN and got a cup of coffee and walked out. Okay. Again, 10 people, maybe. Today, there must have been 472,000 employees that were all there that morning that saw him walk through. Everybody claims to have been there. Right, right. Rex the Wonder Dog <laughs> was one night before we were on satellite even. So again, we had probably as many people that were working at CNN watching the show. <laughs> but for some reason, everybody that knows of me knows Rex the Wonder Dog. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's like the whole world <laughs> has seen Rex the Wonder Dog. <laughs> and he was only there one it was night. The one night, but everybody's seen. What, I have to ask you about the unknown reporter. 
was that the unknown newsman? Oh no, sorry, the unknown newsman. Because he, I loved him, and I remember yeah. one. So was he on a lot, or was he just a one time too? But no, I no, no, him. he was on a lot. Unknown. Okay. Well, we used to call him unknown. Well, okay. unknown. Well, that's what we used to call it. <laughs> and but, here are uh, the pictures of his unknown family when he was. That, that was. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, that, well, it, wait. Here's the worst. Here's unknown's worst story. <laughs> When CNN was being launched, Newsweek did a story on this news news channel. Okay. And they had two pictures in the article. One was of me and the unknown newsman with the bag on his head, next to a picture of uh, Daniel Shore, who was our big news guy at the time, talking to President Jimmy Carter. <laughs> And it said, can it go from this to this? Okay. <laughs> so now I was in Newsweek, you know, my family, oh, Bill's in Newsweek. Well, Jerry, the unknown newsman, Jerry was his real name. He's telling his family, I'm in Newsweek. <laughs> no, it's really me. It's really yeah, me. Like, he said, that's me with the bag on my head. And everybody's oh going, yeah, sure. That was, so that's <laughs> Jerry's big claim to fame. <laughs> So how many years did you do the news at 3 a.m.? How long? That was only 70, maybe 75 to 80. It was oh, okay. five years, five okay. years. That, well, but that's, that was the best part. It, and it, then, so, you know, it, I mean, that's when the, the 70s at Turner Broadcasting, uh, you could never, never get that feeling again. Yeah. yeah. Because... You know, every day it was something new. You never knew what was going to happen. Uh, Ted kept getting more popular. The news kept getting more popular. Yeah. And then we went on satellite, you know, and suddenly we're getting letters from all over the country about watching the crazy news show and all this. And it, it was just, a, a, and I never worked with a group of people that were so into just loving their jobs. I mean, everybody to this day, they're you know, we all stay in touch with with each other. Right. And we've been friends now like 40 years. Which is wonderful. I don't think that yeah. happens anymore. And yeah. I feel like yeah. I feel like that in, in any industry, it may not come back. So I don't think I, you know, <laughs> I went to a reunion, another reunion. They got, I, I quit going to reunions. I got tired of them. You know, it's like, okay, you know. But I took a date to this one reunion and, uh, I said, are you sure you want to go? You're not going to know it. She's, no, I want to go. All right. So we went. But she was amazed by how many people would talk to each other about how many years they've been with the company. You know, I was there from 74 to 86 or whatever. You know, I was there 30 years, 20 years. She said that in her business, everybody's just looking for the next job. Right. right. You know? And so I guess that it is rare. I mean, like I said, that's what people used to say to me. Why don't you, you know, go somewhere else? How come you never change jobs? And yeah. I'm like, I was too happy there. Right. I was, if anything, and now that I'm the age I am and, and retired, you know, I look back and think I had too much fun. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, <clears throat> you, know you, you, you look and you think, boy, I wish I could go back and do that over again. Because to, to yeah. us who were who were watching, you looked like you were having fun. And that, yeah, that, it was, was. that was sort of the joy of watching the Tush show for me and, and, and watching the news in the middle of the night. I mean, you I could tell y'all were having a ball. And I, there was something sort of magical about what y'all were doing. Um, yeah, can we it talk was about magical. the Tush show a little bit? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So yeah. My, my dad and I would watch it. it. It was Friday and Saturday nights. It was both nights on the weekends. Is that is that it right? originally started <laughs> originally started on Sunday nights at seven o'clock because okay. here we are doing our first big production ever at Turner Broadcasting, spending what at that time was a fortune, everybody working their butts off, and the show was airing at seven o'clock on Saturday night or Sunday nights, right up against sixty minutes. Right. So yeah. <laughs> we were dead from the beginning. Yeah. You know. And we were a little cable company and the TBS wasn't what it is today. You know, it was still, you know, one of those channels you would have to find. Right. So I don't remember and, it on Sundays. I must have not seen it till it went yeah. to the weekend. Well, okay. I think it, it started after the first run on Sundays and it went to, uh, we put it on Saturdays and it might've been on Fridays too. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. And and so what? Whose idea? <clears throat> excuse me. Whose idea was it? Because I saw an interview with you and Ted and your and your talk, and he goes, "I think we should have a yeah." Write and it was his idea. Little show. So he that came was up the with tape. the idea. That was that was the tape that started it. Okay. And you then know, and, and they they kept that tape and they had they they had it labeled Bill's video contract <laughs> because oh it was clear he it, didn't want you leaving it was very clear yeah but here's yeah but here's what nobody got Ted said to me shake my hand and promise me you'll never leave that you'll never leave working for me I mean those aren't the exact words but that's yeah. what he did yeah that you'll stay with me and I agreed. Okay. Everybody said, wow, you got a deal, man, for your life. <laughs> what they never realized was he never said the, uh, the other side is that he kept saying, you'll stay and work for me. But it never said that he could change his mind right. and go, you know what? Yeah. You agreed to it, but I don't want you anymore. <laughs> you're fired. <laughs> Get out of here. You're agreeing to the voluntary slavery yeah. that you're going to put yeah, you But it looked, like, it looked like a solid contract. Yeah. Although I do remember him saying something about minimum wage or what, and it wasn't going to be more. Oh yeah. Well, that, that <laughs> wasn't a was joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, my first uh, seeing of, of some of your castmates, uh, like, like Jan hooks who, you know, I, I'd love to hear about her because she was just a, well, Jan a was, wonderful uh, person. well, she, I mean, she was just a good Southern girl from Cedar town, Georgia. And uh, she worked with Bonnie and Terry Turner. Mm -hmm. Okay, they had a lounge act. They were part of another incarnation of what was known as the Wits End Players. Right. That had been around since the 1940s in Atlanta. That they played dinner theater. Well, somebody told us about them, so we went and watched them one night, and we ended up hiring Bonnie and Terry, who had never been in television. And they said, can we bring Jan along with us too? Okay. So Jan had never worked in television either. Uh, and that was everybody's first job in television was working on this show. Gotcha. So nobody had a clue how to put together a comedy show. Uh, nobody knew what they were doing, you know, and Jan was an actress. Oh, Jan she, could be yeah. anything or anybody. Oh, she was wonderful. Yeah. But it didn't look like you didn't know what you were doing. It looked like everybody had their act together, clearly. I mean, well, no one yeah. knew. But no. I mean, it's, it's uh, how we ever did. I mean, it's, it's a mystery to me today that, uh, that, you know, we had all these people working on staff that were writers and performers. We didn't have any strictly writers, you know. Right. And Bonnie and Terry used a lot of their stuff was uh, stuff that they did from the Wits End Players. That became the most popular thing. They did the drive-in funeral. We're back to funerals now. <laughs> the drive-in funeral home. Yep. And uh, they came up with Tammy Jean, which was Jan's oh. most popular thing. Tammy Jean was uh, a takeoff of uh, Tammy Faye okay. Baker. <laughs> and I mean, you know, she would like hold up this this cup asking for money. I have a pot. Send us your money. Yeah. I have you know. a pot. My inspirational yeah, I, pot is in. Yeah, the inspirational. Yeah, it's, that's what I, I I used to do Tammy Jean skits at school. That's and so. Oh, that's funny. Oh, no. I, I just, and, and Wade and Rona, and, you know, I just, I, I ate all of that stuff up. I, it was just. Oh, that's a, a, well, I'm telling you, that was the oh, most popular, the sketch of the most popular wonderful. sketch. And it's, you know what, it doesn't age either. You know, I looked at a couple last week and I'm like, they're still as funny as they ever were. Yeah. And, and back then sketch comedy was new. I mean, I guess SNL had started and SCTV had started, but you know, now you can swing a dead cat and hit an improv group in my driveway, but that didn't exist oh. back then. So it was super new. How did you find Terry and Bonnie? How did you just- Well, that's what I said. We, uh, <clears throat> somebody told us about this Wits End Players. He's going there, okay. She, yeah, I mean, that's where, that's where they came from. We went there, uh, I remember going to this club in downtown Atlanta called the Midnight Sun. That's where they were playing. Okay. And I swear the only people in the audience were myself, R.T. Williams, the producer of the show, and maybe two other people from our show. I don't think there was anybody else in the place, <laughs> you know. 
Well, and, uh, it was magic. And Bonnie and, you know, Bonnie and Terry went on to become big, big television producers. I mean, they yeah. did uh, Third Rock from the Sun. They created it, I think. Yeah. Uh, they worked on a couple. Well, the, the story is when Jan got Saturday Night Live, uh, Bonnie and Terry were still uh, here in Atlanta working for Turner doing some obscure show just, you know, just to collect a paycheck. Right. And they contacted Jan and said, could you get us in to talk to Lauren Michaels? Right. And she set that up and that's how they came into gotcha. Saturday Night Live. Oh, that's and then they became the darlings of Saturday Night Live writers. I mean, well, it, it's know. not surprising. I mean, they knew what they were doing. Yeah. You gotta give them credit. They knew, I mean, maybe they didn't themselves know, but they had an instinct to know what to do. You know? Yeah, it no, it was, that whole show was magical. Y'all had, you also had some really good guest star. Like I remember James Brown was on there one time. Like y'all had lots of crazy people. That well, were we had one show uh, that had about eight major guests on it. And I'm trying to remember them all. It was Burt Reynolds, Jacqueline Bissett, John Hausman, uh, Muhammad Ali, and it, it, a list of about eight major people. And how that happened was Burt Reynolds was in town doing Sharky's Machine, mm -hmm. the movie. Yep. And the PR people brought him, said he'd like to do the show, be on your show. But we were all excited, you know. We were too stupid to realize it was the PR people. Said, but Bert had no clue what it was. <laughs> but we were thinking, oh, he's a big fan. He wants to know? come. Yeah. So anyway, the day he came, he was such a major star. We had to shut down the front entrance to Turner Broadcasting and bring him in a van into the garage. It was like Elvis, you know. <laughs> so uh, anyway, Bert comes in and we had all these sketch ideas. And he was going to go, uh, we had, you know, we were going to put him in this sketch and put him in that sketch. He says, no, 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 no. He said, why don't we do this? He says, I'll come on the show and say, I don't want to be on the show. And that'll be the gag. I'll be talking <laughs> to you saying, I don't want to do this show. And we said, yeah, whatever you want, Bert. Sure, whatever you want. Yeah. And we thought it was funny. Yeah. So we did it and it was funny. Yeah. <laughs> well, then by coincidence, at that time, CNN was downstairs from TBS. We were all in the same building. Right. Well, CNN had these guests popping in for the CNN shows. So they'd be out in the lobby. John Hausman, who at that time was famous for the paper chase. Paper chase, chase yes. We went out and got a very stuffy Englishman, very prim and proper bow tie. We said to him, would you like to be on the show? He says, all right, I don't know. I mean, we drag him in the studio. <laughs> And uh, we says, the thing is, you, you, want to, you don't want to be on the show, but you're on the show. So he played along with it, and he was hysterical. He was doing this whole thing, saying, this, everything here disgusts me. He says, this, this set makes me sick. And he was, he was doing all, but that one, and then, then we, Jacqueline Bissett was sitting out in the hallway. Oh, out. that's great. So we dragged her in. And uh, Muhammad Ali, he came in and him and I walking down the set and he's doing a poem, one of his poems <laughs> that he just made up on the spot about not wanting to be there. <laughs> so, so he had this show with a million dollars worth of guests all saying they don't want to be on the show. It's and it was beautiful. just one of those, yeah, it was just one of those crazy, uh, again, it was timing. You know? Yeah, all timing. The universe, yeah. I, just, it, again, I, I miss it. Yeah. I wish I wish things like that existed now, but they don't, so we're going to, we're just going to. I know, yeah. but I should say that was that was one show that had all those people oh, on, but other that. shows, we had a lot of <clears throat> a lot of guest stars on. Well, it's so, yeah. it, it, it surprised me because I thought it ran longer than, y'all only did it for a year, and I thought it ran longer than that. In my head, I had it longer. So it's, sort of, it's become the Rex, of Wonder, Rex the Wonder Dog <laughs> of variety shows. I'm, then I People. must have seen every episode because I, I, yeah. they may, may have gone to reruns or something, but I remember watching them. So Yeah, I think we did 22 of them. Oh, okay. 20, and, yeah, which 22 of them. And yeah, were, well, you know, that's why I had this discussion the other day with a friend of mine when we were talking about the, these television shows on Netflix. They go season one and there's like eight shows. Yeah. I yeah. said, you realize when television first began, like I Love Lucy, they did 39 shows a year. Right. Right. You know, 
And that was a season, 39 episodes. 39 shows. You crank them now up. Now it's like five episodes is a season. No, that, yeah. does, that doesn't work for me at all. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, you know, we got, we got the word one day. Ted said, that's it. He said, we're closing it down. He said, because it costs too much money and it's not working. <laughs> and, you know, and again, I mean, in hindsight, I wish I would have fought more for it. I wish yeah. I would have gone up and said to him, Ted, come on, give us a chance here. You know, you yeah. don't know what you got here. You know, because I mean, there are people like you that are just fans of that show. No, it was, you know, it was, remember different. so much of it. Yeah. It, it really, it, it was part, and I think part of it is why I do comedy now. You know, I really, yeah. yeah I, I, you know, part of it, that upbringing of watching it with my dad and, and, and just laughing my head off at the Tammy Faye show. And I don't know, there's something to be said for, you know, I went to law school and then eventually came out the other end in comedy yeah because of that sort of like instilled in me but anyway so part of that yeah is, well, i mean i think that's great that's i mean that's that's terrific to hear yeah, I mean, it, you know because i get i do talk to a lot of people that talk you know how much they love the show yeah. and then and it's always you know, i used to kid her i said why don't they just call this show hooks <laughs> no, but well, the first was, thing people would say to me was, yeah. "I love Jan Hooks." <laughs> no, she was great, but it was, it was definitely it was an ensemble. It was all of y'all together, and it, it was yeah. part of it was the camp too that you didn't have a budget and that you're in the spaces oh. that are the sauna outfits and the you know part of it. That's why it was funny and endearing is that you didn't have a budget and it wasn't high tech production. I I think well, that's I'm a, you know you know this is funny is. What you talk about it not being high tech and, and and I mean literally it was the old we got a curtain in the barn thing. <laughs> well, I never understood why there was a curtain in the barn. <laughs> anyway, why would you have a curtain? The little rascals, we got a show. Yeah, yeah, but uh, it, that's what it was with us. I mean, like the props and things like that, they were all made up. We'd bring them in from home for crying out loud. <laughs> but I was what well, last Easter, I was watching the Ten Commandments, the Cecil B. DeMille thing. And there's Yule Brenner sitting on his throne in his throne room and Charlton Heston comes in. I'm looking at the set. I says, it looks like the Tush show for crying out. <laughs> they, they need a better budget. They need a bigger I mean, this was the Ten Commandments. You know? <laughs> we couldn't even afford one commandment. They had 10. They had lousy sets. They couldn't get more for Cecil B. DeMille to do that. <laughs> Okay, so so sadly, I'm going to move forward past the the Bill Tush show because um, it's still my favorite part. But you went out to to Hollywood and you and and you you kicked poor old Mike Douglas to the curb. You're the only one that remembers that. You're the first <laughs> one that's ever said that. I mean, I, if I've got any place in television history, <laughs> I'm the man that replaced Mike Douglas. While he was, while he was on vacation or something? I know. <laughs> it's, it's a cruel world. It's a tough business. I'm, so, I'm laughing because I laugh at funerals. So I'm just thinking there's something, <laughs> there's something funny about kicking poor old Mike Douglas to the curb. But well, you especially the guy was such a legend. You know, I was watching a rerun of Ed Sullivan here on one of the local off-the-air channels. Uh, and uh, they were running Ed Sullivan. He says, and here's Mike Douglas. And Mike Douglas is on the Ed Sullivan show. I'm going, oh, my God, I got that. I kicked the guy out of his job. What did, what did he do before he was an, like a He host? was a singer. No, they uh, tell you the story about it. You know, Roger Ailes was one of Mike Douglas's key producers. Oh, okay, okay. In the 60s. And Mike was a, a nightclub performer, a singer. And he was as white bread and generic and straight down the middle as you could find. Yeah. And they created him. Oh, okay. I mean, they created Mike. And uh, he was just this nice, wonderful guy that everybody liked. And I mean, there was a time, uh, you know, in the afternoons, that, that, that was the highest rated show. He was the Ellen DeGeneres of yeah. his day. Yeah. You know, we watched it. Yeah. We watched a lot. Of, I, but I, I, I guess I wasn't old enough to realize he had a singing career before he began. Yeah. Well, career. he always wanted to be. Don't you remember? He had one hit record. One hit record, 1965, if I have to double check, called The Men in My Little Girl's Life. As a daughter, I would think you would know this. Did your father didn't no, sing this to you? It sounds creepy. Oh, my it God. Sounds a little oh, it creepy. was creepy. <laughs> it sounds it a was creepy. creepy. <laughs> It, it was, yeah, but yeah, it was uh, the man in my little girl's life. She well, came up to me, Daddy. 
I just met a boy. His name is Jim. He wants to know if I can go out with him. The man in my little girl's life. That's what the song was. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I it was be, number one. I will be pulling that up on Spotify shortly this afternoon. No, after this, go find it. You'll find it. <laughs> okay. So you go out and you kick Mike Douglas to the curb and you... <laughs> <laughs> And I hate you were, to think of it that way. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I get it. funerals. Um, <laughs> so, did you like being out in Hollywood? That was still part of CNN, right? But that was CNN was. It was. It was. A, it was a TBS CNN show. It was on TBS every day at noon, and then aired at night uh, on CNN, like at 10 o'clock at night. It was a celebrity interview show. Okay. And it again was in the early days of CNN. And the studio was nothing more than an office that had been opened up and lights hung in it and, you know, it was turned into a TV studio. Okay. And it was in Hollywood and they sent me out. And that's a show that I got it when it was struggling. And then it just continued to die after I got it. And again, I look back and say, boy, I should have just, you know, stuck with the writers and producers on that show you know we had a staff of young kids mm -hmm. that worked on it and a couple of them went on the big things you know but uh we couldn't even get people would come by and not even know what they were on the, oh, the star really? the publicist would bring them by and they'd be yeah. going what am, what is this i'm on anyway it's yeah. a cnn yeah what is what is that yeah that's pretty much what it was. But was it, uh, it wasn't like in the first days of entertainment television, I mean, entertainment reporting. I, I well, it called. was entertainment. Entertainment Tonight was the only game in town. You right. Know? And, and this was, you know, we were trying to build, I was basically taking over the Mike Douglas show. Right, right. You know, Mike was still doing the show uh, the way he was doing the one when he was big. Right. And... You know, he didn't have the same support he had when he was, you know, Mike Douglas. Right, right. So, uh, you know, he was working. But he was, again, he was a heck of a nice guy. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I kicked him to bad. the curb. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, sorry, Mike Douglas's family. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that was People Now, right? That was the name of that one. Yeah. And then, and then after that was. Oh yeah, I still after after the Tush show it was a long stumble down. No, uh, it wasn't a stumble down. <laughs> no, no, I'm not letting you do that. Yeah. No, what happened was after after People Now, I guess I did that about a year, and then I was I was literally in L.A working doing some stuff for cnn hit and miss things but nothing you know and then we just started this show called showbiz today okay and they said to me do you want to move to new york and i'm like you know you didn't have to ask i mean it was like i think they asked me when i was on the plane going to new york that's how fast <laughs> i wanted to go you know and uh, because, I mean, I always wanted to be in New York. Oh, really? Always okay. wanted to be ah, in New York. Okay. And here now, all of a sudden, I'm going to New York. And so for the last 20 years before I retired, it was, uh, yeah, well, I was probably close to 20 years, 80, maybe 83 to 98. Uh, how many every years that is? Yeah. Uh, I, I did the, the showbiz show on CNN. And, uh, and, and that was done, uh, by that point, we were very well known. I mean, right. we, you know, I mean, I did the Oscars every year. I did the red carpet. Right. You know, uh, but the days of me being wacky and funny and crazy, I couldn't do it anymore. I had to be serious, you, you know. You had to put on your tuxedo and be a yeah, serious yeah, person. I mean, yeah. But, yeah. but yeah. at that point, you had, you had the budget behind you and you had staffing behind you and writers? Did you? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. All yeah. That? It was, it yeah. was a full-blown entertainment show. Yeah. It was, yeah. uh, you know, we had, uh, you know, they don't have it on CNN anymore. I don't even know if CNN does news anymore. I mean, I'm not I don't, I, I don't watch it if they do. I don't, I don't either. Yeah. So. I don't have, you know what? I hate to admit it. I don't have cable. That's okay. You can admit that. A lot well, of I was the don't. guy, I used to travel around the country telling yeah. everybody it was the future. <laughs> well, it was at that point. It was. And then come over the, the other I've outlived way. the future. It's gone. Do you remember yeah. when, do you remember when CNN was the world of Sid and Marty Croft? Oh, yeah. No, I was, <laughs> I was at the opening night of that. Uh, yeah, I, they I, had, 
it, no, was, good. it was crazy, that thing. So I didn't know you were at the opening. What was that like? Were they there, the guys? They had a, uh, I think so, they had a big uh, black tie opening. At that time, the main floor at the Omni, where CNN used to be was in, in Atlanta, yeah. it was ice skating. Yeah. And then the level where CNN was, was the world of Sid and Marty Croft. And right. they had that escalator that would yep. take you up to it. Yeah. And it was supposed to take you to this marvelous experience. Now, I shouldn't admit this to you on television or wherever this goes. <laughs> wherever, the, but wherever it goes. Wherever it is out in outer Whatever space. Whatever funeral home we're going to play it in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Play now. <laughs> anyway, uh, I went there opening night, had, had some drinks, and then they took us up the escalator, and here we are. It was the most boring event. It was so boring. <laughs> and so I said, a few weeks later, I said to my wife, I said, let's go down to the world of Sid Marty Croft again and, and, and uh, give it another shot. So our best friends, the, the other couple, you know, couples always hang with couples. They came over, we we're all the four of us are going to go. So we appropriately have to, or we have to get stoned pre -game. before we go. We got a pregame before we yeah, go. Yeah, we're pregame, yeah. So we, we're going to get stoned to go have some fun at Marty Croft. World <laughs> so we go there stoned. It still sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it was the worst, the worst, I mean. <laughs> it was just nothing about it was memorable. Nothing about it. And I think that's why it was so disappointing was that the, the TV shows were so great and so fun, yeah. you know, and, and then yeah. you go there and you're like, where is Sigmund and the Sea Monsters? He's not here. It was, it was terrible. Where, yeah, it was. It, it, and it closed in six months. It closed in six months later. I think I went there an embarrassing number of times because I like to ice skate at the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was all about the ice skating, but I think we went there maybe three or four times, but it was, um, anyway, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I well, I'll, I'll tell you, there. I'll tell you a story. Marty Croft, Sid Croft, his brother hides out on the beach somewhere. Nobody ever sees Sid Croft. Right. Marty was the personality of the two brothers. Right. Well, he did a movie, which I can't find anywhere, which wasn't a bad movie. It was Ann Margaret was in it. It was called Middle Age Crazy was Bruce Dern and Ann Margaret. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he but was it was actually that? wasn't a bad, no, Sid produced it. Okay. I mean, Marty, Marty Croft produced it. It was a 20th Century Fox movie. Well, Marty came to Atlanta to promote it. At this time, the Omni was still the Omni Hotel. Right. The world of Sid and Marty Croft was dark. You know, it was yeah. gone. There was yeah. nothing there. It was before CNN. Well, my buddy, who was a PR guy for 20th Century Fox, as a joke, put Marty up at the Omni Hotel with a room overlooking <laughs> this dark world of Sid and Marty Crowd. <laughs> and I was, in, I was in the room with Marty, and we're sitting there. He had a suite, and we're sitting there talking. He says, I can't believe that son of a put me here. He says, look what I got to stare at. <laughs> What did I was looking he's, at that? He says twenty million dollars. Oh. I'll never forget the figure. He said twenty million dollars down the drain. Well, I think that, <laughs> I think that that's time, what it was. They spent too much money, and you know, and everybody in Georgia's like, "Well, this is more expensive than a Six Flags ticket. I'm gonna go ride the Scream Machine." You know, like every all the all of us hillbillies yeah. are like, "There's no roller coaster here." <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, you uh, know, the uh, it was it was it was a talk about a fiasco, a boondoggle, or whatever you call it. That was sad. So, I, right, want, I, yeah. I, I want to skip forward to um, I know you retired in 2003. Is that when you retired from yeah, TBS? two or three, somewhere yeah. around there? It's all a blur, it's now a blur, it's now just a big yeah. cat blur. But you went to Nigeria for so something about well, that's yeah, that was uh, in 2000. 12 or 30, I know, it doesn't matter. But I was uh, living here, divorced by this time. And I get a phone call from some woman that says her cousin is a mogul, television radio mogul, radio mogul in Lagos, Nigeria. And he wants you to come over and help him start another radio station. Okay. He's a big fan of yours. So she gives me his number and I called the guy 
and he's Lebanese. He's built an empire. He's an architect by trade, but owns three radio stations. And he wants me to come over and help him start another one. He wants to do a talk station. That he used to watch me when he was in college in the 70s in Texas, at the University of Texas or something. But he's Lebanese. Okay. And his wife's family, who's also Lebanese, have been living in, in Nigeria since the 1800s or something. And they're Nigerian billionaires. So he says to me, I want you to come over and uh, help us with this station. I'll send you the ticket and I'll send you an advance and blah, blah, blah. And everybody's saying it's a scam. You're out of your mind. And, you know, it, 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 I said, look, I said, I go to Nigeria. They kidnap me and demand a ransom. Nobody's going to pay. <laughs> Nobody's going to want me back. So who cares? Why not? I says, <laughs> yes, <laughs> go. So I got on a plane on Sunday afternoon and went to Lagos, Nigeria and got off the plane and I walked to customs. This was my first experience of how Nigeria worked. <laughs> I go to customs. I'm standing on line with everybody else. And a guy comes over to me and he says my name. He says, you come with me. I don't. So I follow him. I said, what about customs? He says, no, we don't bother with that. We pay them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it was. And that's how Nigeria works. <laughs> that's how Nigeria works. We pay them. Oh my and uh, oh, yeah, I got stories. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so I stayed there for about a month and helped with the radio set and loved it. I just loved it. I mean, I just, I don't know why. I was, I just, the people I liked, I had a great time. I was happy and I had to come back and be miserable because I was single. <laughs> I was, you know, not just in a depressed state in my mind. But then, you know, a couple of years go by, I got another call from him in 2014. And he says, I'm starting a television station. Would you come over and help? I said, I'll be there tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. And I got on the plane. I was back there. This time I was there for a year. Wow, wow. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, I helped get the stay. Unfortunately, none of the TV stations worked because from the day I got there, I, I knew that it was going to be a problem. He was doing everything backwards. Yeah. And he wouldn't, and he was a nice guy, but he was, he, he was doing, they had a big board and uh, conference room that had uh, index cards with what shows were going to be here. They had 60 minutes. They had the gong show. Everything was on in America, but they gave it different names. They called the gong show the bang show. <laughs> yeah. 60 minutes. You know, they had this one girl that was going to be hour. the host. Of yeah, one, one, one hour. hour. I wish I'd have known that. I would have suggested it. I got a bonus. Anyway, uh, I said to him, I says, this is true. I said, I said, you know what it takes to do a show like 60 minutes? I says, you got to have camera crews. I says, it takes research. I says, you just got one person that's standing or reading off the teleprompter going, can he be saved? We talked to him. And this was the answer, <laughs> you know, and that, I'd say, well, what, what's it? But they had, he says, he thinks, he says, we'll call it 30 minutes. <laughs> I swear to you, I swear <laughs> that's a true story. Well, and, then, and, then, and then the gong show, I felt so bad. We actually taped one, but they ran auditions. They, I forget how they got these people, but they ran ads in the paper or something. Would you like to be on this television show? Well, all these Nigerians that want to be stars, you know, that have their bands that sing and it, they thought this was going to be their biggest, biggest break. They didn't understand they had to be lousy and be made right, fun of. Right, right, yeah. So I felt so bad for them. I mean, these people oh. are up there trying their hardest. Yeah. And here's this guy, and he's and now he put himself on the panel, up there banging things. <laughs> this is terrible. They throw them out. Shoot did them. They have, did they have a Nigerian Chuck Barris? Like, did they? Did they well, have... yeah, yeah. And let me think of his name. Oh, he had a great name. Hold on a second. What the heck was his name? Oh, Jesus, it's going to drive me nuts. 
but you do feel I'll think of it as soon as we hang up the huh? concept of, to try to explain the concept of the gong show Kabuchi Kab Kabuchi <laughs> that was his name Kabuchi I'm so sad I'm shocked that it didn't work it, <laughs> <laughs> oh that's too bad oh. I felt really bad oh. I, I really did yeah and uh you know, it was just so they, uh, you know, I came back and uh, they eventually got it on the air. I didn't want to leave. I wanted to stay there. I yeah. actually did. Yeah. But uh, it was just everything went, it went the wrong way with everything. Yeah. yeah. Well, so and I think he sold off. He, oh, I could tell you a million stories. So, so, but he's still living there or is he? he I guess he's still, yeah. you know, got his company and is doing well. You know, yeah. like I said, they were very well off yeah. yeah and 30 minutes is now 30 out. minutes <laughs> i'd go to i'd be at his house for dinner with his wife and the, his grown daughter or whatever and he had servants you know in white coats and bow ties and that was, i mean i'd never experienced anything like this like when he wanted to ring a little bell and they would come out and bring the course and everything <laughs> It's like being in a movie. You know? <laughs> Something's working. So, so you came back from Nigeria, came back home, and yeah, and uh, and uh, I ran into a buddy of mine that owned a local movie theater, and uh, we were going to lunch one day. He said, "I'm looking for a manager for the theater." I said, "I'll take the job." I said, "I ain't got nothing to do. I'll take the job." But you he know says, what? You got it. I just, I I love this part of your story because it the full circle from you selling you know popcorn to your your kid friends and when you were growing up and yeah, and well, I'm assuming I mean, you I, still I, love I, movies and that's still you know part of you. Who well, that you was are. you know that was the main reason was because I mean I do I do love movies and I love movie theaters and you know I, we got eight screens and i you know up until the pandemic i mean we had new movies every week and right. i would watch movies you know and uh like i said i've been and i didn't didn't think i'd be doing it as long as i have been i mean I've been, six years i've been at this theater yeah and uh people come in you know they'll recognize me and i i always wonder what goes through the you know the <laughs> They're probably thinking, well, aren't guys like him supposed to be gazillionaires and <laughs> live on an island somewhere? You know, I there think I am. Everyone thinks everyone else is supposed to be a gazillionaire, but it, yeah, as long here's the thing, and I've gotten to this age too. Is as long as is what you're doing is fulfilling and makes you happy, and you can get up every day and do it and enjoy it, why not do that thing? Do that thing. Well, I'll tell you what. I mean, uh, first of all, getting back into television. Uh, I mean, it would be fun to do something, but let's face it, I'm 72 years old. You know, if I get on here and try to do the news with a dog again, it's not going to be funny. They're going to say, look at that sad old man with a dog. It well, must if, be a seeing eye dog. If somebody came to you like like today and, and said, you can do a TV show, funny, or what, you can do whatever you want, what, would you, what kind of show would you make, do you think? Man, I you know I got I got through all those years basically making it up as I went along. Yeah, <laughs> That's what I yeah. would have to do. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it would probably just be uh, you know something. Just I'd have to give it some thought. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, we'll have part two what... of our interview and we'll have to. No, oh, jeez. Yeah, because I I do think that there's still I go back to there's nothing like we had back then and the things that are being put out now you know i have to take the pandemic as an asterisk so put that aside we know things are shut down but if if you were given carte blanche right now to do something fun what would it be and i, I don't i don't know the answer to that i think it'd be kind yeah. of funny to even think about it but yeah I mean, and that's... you're so and so one one last question is if you could go back and tell the the guy that walked into um let me go i'll go further if you could go back to the polka party host kid and give him a piece of advice or tell him something what what would that be if you could go back and tell your polka party self don't have too much fun <laughs> because that's what i mean that's what i did i mean i just had fun uh i mean granted the early years you know uh, i don't know how much fun that like, i can't remember back that far but I mean, it's like I said, I mean, it just, and even Ted said that when they, they gave him a lifetime uh, Emmy a few years ago. And when he accepted it, he said, you know, they always say, uh, he says, you read these books saying about uh, television genius, uh, you know, visionary, this and that. He says, we were just having fun. Yeah. 
And uh, he says, that's all it was. It was just fun. And, and I think it would be don't have too much fun because be, ser be a little more serious. Just a little yeah. bit more. But I, a little I, bit more. yeah, I, th I think that, like I said, it was clear to me watching you guys and watching you in particular doing what you did back then that you were having fun. But I also yeah. feel like that was the what, what was so endearing is like this guy's having, you know, he thinks, oh, yeah, you know, we had a great time watching you because you were having fun, which I thought was great. So, yeah, well, I'm glad that came across because yep. we were, I mean, we really, we really were. Like I said, I don't know how you could ever duplicate that. <laughs> you know, well, you I don't know how. I think we're going to yeah. have to come up with, put the fun in funeral something. Maybe we'll have. Maybe, a there you go. That'll be next. <laughs> the Put the fun in funeral business. Funerals and movies, we'll, we'll do it all too. Maybe you could have people come in for a funeral and watch a movie with the person on the stage. We'll talk, I've got ideas. Well, they'll just, they, they can just look at me and go, well, he had a few in. <laughs> he now he's added been. the rest. <laughs> You know. Oh my gosh! But, Thank yeah. you so much. Well, this was this has been this has been oh, a lot of fun. This no, has I'm been. Just, I really I I'm, really enjoyed it. It was wonderful. Like I said, my my dad is smiling from heaven right now, making us get up at three o'clock in the morning to watch you do the news. He, he was. Well, tell him to go find my dad and go have a beer. <laughs> go have some fun up there. It'll be good. <laughs> yeah.